but I want to introduce a couple of projects to you that we have on the go there. Two of them are brand new this year. Um, <clears throat> but we're pumping water there today, so um, it's not very conducive to getting in the field, and we'll probably be pumping water there for a while. Uh, my colleague, Sherry um, Stridehorst, who works out of Barhead, was successful in securing funding for a, a fairly large project last year uh, well, that we started this year. And so it's advanced agronomic practices in wheat, barley, and, and uh, field pea to maximize yield and harvestability. And so Sherry is kind of the project lead on this. We have a site up with, in, in conjunction with Sarda up at Falaire. Sherry's looking after one at, at Bon Accord. Robin Bonas, who will be here at the field school, um, coming up is also looking after a site at Killam and we're looking after a dryland site at High River and an irrigated site at McGrath but we have one of those components from the the McGrath site over on our jail land. Um, so there's several different aspects to this project uh, but essentially it's looking at the combination of what Cherry calls advanced agronomic practices and it's really in crop nitrogen, the use of growth regulators and, and the use of fungicides to try to push yield higher and higher. So in our, um, in our wheat stacked agronomic practices that we have over on the jail land, um, it was um, AC foremost that was seeded with a fairly aggressive rate of nitrogen at the time of seeding. We were at about 105 pounds that we, that we put down and, and Sherry's working in pounds, so if you're used to working in metric, I'm sorry. We're used to working in metric and it's really confusing. So we went with a fairly high rate of, of nitrogen at the time of seeding. Um, oh, last week, early last week, we went in with two rates of UAN at 30, 30 pounds to the acre and at 60 pounds to the acre, and also 30 pounds to the acre with, with Agrotain. So a fairly good shot of in-crop nitrogen. We've also gone in with the growth regulator and on the wheat, we're using two different products. In the, in the barley, we're using one different, one growth regulator. So there's a, a growth regulator component and then we're still gonna be coming up to a, a fungicide at flag leaf, a fungicide at heading and a, a combination of fungicide at, at um, flag leaf and heading. That's kind of the, the core experiment. We're doing something very similar with, with on wheat and barley where we are having these in a, in a, sectionally in a factorial combination. So there's upwards of 50 different management practices. And if you were doing the, probably doing the math in your head of what does this all cost? Uh, yeah, we're not, there will be an economic um, portion to the, the project looking at essentially all the input costs and what the returns are. That's the core experiment. Um, in addition to that, we're doing something very similar to a range of genetic materials. So in the, bar, in the wheat, I think we have 10 different uh, spring wheats where we are either putting all of those inputs on or none of them. So it's it's kind of just to see if there is a difference between different varieties and how they respond to a whack of inputs. So we're doing that in wheat and barley and um, stacked agronomics where we're, we're able to determine whether it's one input or a combination of inputs that would give us the maximum return. So that, this project is, uh, will be in the field this year and for the next two growing seasons and it does have a um, an economic component to it. We'll try to get back onto that site towards the end of July. We'll, we'll schedule another day. Hopefully at that stage, we'll be able to see whether the growth regulator is indeed shortening the crop. Um, Cause some of those treatments will have a real whack of nitrogen down on them and the very high potential for, for lodging other ways. Um, Sherry played around with this last year and, and did see you know, roughly a 10 centimeter reduction in height using the, with the growth regulator. We'll see how it turns out this year. So that's a, a fairly large project. It's funded by um, ACID-F, um, Alberta Wheat Commission, 
Alberta Barley Commission, Alberta Pulse Commission, um, Alberta Innovates Biosolutions, and then a lot of in-kind contributions from most of the chemical companies, Syngenta, BASF, Engage Agro. I better see my list to make sure I'm not forgetting somebody. Bayer and, and Coke Agronomic Services. We're not running the, the P component of the project. Uh, Sherry's only running that at Killam and her Bon Accord site. But essentially it's inter-row seeding peas into wheat stubble of varying heights. So in, in this, uh, this setup year, they're just growing wheat and then they'll um, cut it to different heights and then next year they'll be seeding peas into that um, inter-row seeding to see whether that stubble height will affect the standability of the subsequent pea crop. But we're not running that at, at one of our sites. Any questions? Is there a certain growth states that you're putting on the UAM and the Agrotin? The, um, a lot of it keys around the growth regulator. And we wanted to be, the growth regulator, we're, we were trying to hit that uh, 31 to 32 growth stage. So when we're, when the, the nodes are present, we want to have the UAN on ahead of that. So we were going on with the UAN about the five leaf stage and we were, we were hitting the growth regulator when, that, um, when we were hitting that um, between 31 and 32, when that node was present at the bottom. So we're trying to get the UA on, on fairly early and then not interfere with the, the growth regulator. So are you trying to stimulate tillering then when the UA goes on? Or are you looking at more protein? It's, or it's still out? yield. Still, yeah. The, the big driver is still yield. But a good question, I guess, is what, how are you trying to get that yield? By increasing your heads with less heads or having more heads? Um, no, the, more the thinking is just making sure that we're not running short of, of nitrogen. <laughs> the other new project that we have on the go uh, starting this year is a, an, inter an integrated approach to fusarium head blight management. Um, and, and we're standing in one of Ken's um, fusarium plots, spring wheat, uh, winter wheat. We're only working with um, spring wheats where we're looking at the combination of, of variety resistance, presence of inoculum, use of fungicides, and then environment. So our, it's a split plot where our main plot is either irrigated or dry land. And then on half of our plots, we went out and sampled a grain corn field, sampled the bottom node, uh, found a field where every node that we tested was pre had Fusarium graminium present. We took our forage harvester in there and collected um, stubble and spread stubble on roughly half of our plots just to kind of push the pressure for, for Fusarium. Um, we're using three different genetics. Um, so we're using Lillian, which is a very poor fusarium head blight resistance. Uh, Carberry, which is about as good as we get. And then we're using um, Strongfield Durham. And, and all of our Durhams are, are essentially quite poor as far as fusarium head blight resistance. Um, and then we will go in at, at early flowering to hit it with half of our plots with the fungicide registered for um, fusarium head blight suppression, and then we've got the irrigation thing going on. Um, this is our initial year. We're only running it on our jail land this year. Hopefully next year we'll, we'll expand it onto our Bow Island substation as well, just to get a slightly different environment, because I tend to be of the opinion that I think environment greatly affects fusarium um, infection. Um, and the Bow Island is even though we're not that far away, is, is somewhat of a different environment than we have here as far as our cool nights here, which I think is a factor. Um, so we're, we're, this is our initial year on that. We'll see how it goes as the season goes along. Um, we'll be, that project is funded by Acid F and Alberta Wheat Commission, and I just want to acknowledge them for that. Then the, the third thing that we would have seen there today um, we're into our second year of a, of a fertigation 
on wheat and canola. And the joke around the office is, if you ever want to see rain, wait till Al Middleton goes out there and applies, uh, applies irrigation to our plot. So Al was out last week <coughs> uh, putting down our first fertigation treatment, and this week it rains. And, and the same thing happened last year. He put out the fertigation treatment, and the next week it rained. Um, but I guess he is, has a longer history of doing that whenever he fertigates. I mean, whenever he irrigates our plot land, it almost always rains the following week. Um, so in that project, um, we have a full range of N applied at the time of seeding. So from uh, in 30 kilogram per hectare increments up to up to 150 kilograms N per hectare. So a full rate of, of N mid-row band at the time of seeding. Um, there is ESN as a component of that. Then on top of that, we go in at um, roughly that five leaf stage on the, on the cereals and, and wherever our canola is at the same time. Uh, we want to go in at, at flag leaf and at, um, at heading. So our flag leaf and heading are very close together in, in timing. Um, and then there is one treatment that gets all of those, all three of those treatments. So a, a total of 90 N in crop through fertigation. So last year, I, I thought we had some really interesting results come out of that. I, I presented a bit of those results at the irrigated crop production update, um, where, the, where we were actually getting a yield advantage when, we, when there was a shot of nitrogen fertigated into that crop, especially at that early staging. Uh, whereas in, on, on, the, on the wheat, in the canola, about the best we could do is we could maintain the yield equal to that um, mid-row banding. So there, there seems to be a difference between wheat and canola, either a, as far as the timing of that application or the form of N that they're accessing early in the season, and so that can influence yield. The results this year might be different, so we'll have to wait and see. So those are some of the projects that we have on the go that are relatively new over on our jail land. We'll try to reschedule um, an, another day either towards the end of July or early August so that we can see, hopefully see the differences in the growth regulator. Um, maybe by then we might see whether our, our corn fusarium inoculum was effective in boosting our fusarium pressure so that we can actually have some visual effects on that we might be able to see there as well. But I'll, I'll send out an email towards the end of July um, if we do reschedule that date. I saw some very sandy, gravelly soil. The fertigation is almost imperative. It would be weakened there while the crop was growing. Otherwise, it was going through. Okay. Uh, we're on a clay loam <clears throat> soil over there, which is why it's extremely wet. Yeah, um, and we have heard that. And a lot of. When I tell people about this project, they say, well, what are you doing on potatoes? And I go, we're working on wheat and canola. Because um, the potatoes on the sandier land, um, much more of an issue. Maybe that will come in subsequent projects. Is there a timing schedule the <clears throat> About the best literature out there, Guy Lafon did some work with in-crop nitrogen, so again, in a dry land situation, not in a irrigated situation where he was putting it on that in crop in and trying to influence yield. He, his finding was that um, if you were applying the in crop nitrogen prior to bolting, it could influence yield. Um, so we were going on with our first fertigation at roughly that five to six leaf stage, so like a very late roundup application staging. And, and we were able to maintain yield comparable to a mid-row banded rate. So um, if we mid-row banded 90, and when you compared that to a mid-row banded 60 with 30 in crop, they, their yield was equal. Whereas if you were to compare those same two products in wheat, there would have been a yield advantage with that fertigated product on wheat. So there, there, at least from our first year, so there, it looked like 
there was a difference in between wheat and canola either on timing or in the form of N that they're accessing. <clears throat> well, last year, our first fertigation was the week before we got 130 millimeters of rain. This year, our first fertigation was the week before we got 145 millimeters of rain. Um, there is a strong potential for denitrification losses. Last year, we didn't see it because our ESN, which should have been protected, was the same as the urea at the comparable rate. But uh, we had hoped to actually be collecting greenhouse gas information information off of those plots this year. Um, uh, Guillermo, what's Guillermo's rest? Hernandez Ramirez from the U of A, uh, Dean Dick from, Miles Dick from the U of A, had put in a, a, an application to the Canadian Fertilizer Institute to access growing forward money. And we thought that would be going ahead this year. That project was rejected. They've since reapplied. Um, and we're hoping then that we're going to be getting greenhouse gas, um, so the nitrous oxide loss information off of those plots next year. Um, that information is quite limited under irrigated situations. So, like, when we have saturated soils, like, you can easily lose, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds while that soil is saturated over a couple of days. And it would sure be nice to have some data to kind of support that under our irrigated situations. I'm just wondering if your, your timing was that you go back in. And it <laughs> Unless it's raining when we have to fertigate, that's, uh, that's, right now we've, we've fixed it according to growth stage. We haven't tried to modify it according to the weather, unless we're gonna have to do that, depending on what happens with the weather. But, you know, I would think we are under good loss potential now and that the next fertigation might compensate if losses occur. And hopefully we'll be able to pick that up with the ESN and versus the, the straight urea to see whether that is indeed happening. But the differences between the canola and the wheat, could that be a, a gross stage timing? It might be that canola needs a different stage than when you're putting it on the wheat? It, it could be timing, it could be form of N as well. Last year we, we ran a, an in-crop nitrogen experiment where we, were, where we were using N15 isotopes on the UAN, either on the urea, ammonium, or nitrate component. Both wheat and canola are, are accessing that nitrate component equally, but the wheat was accessing the urea and the ammonium component more than the canola was. So, so if, if, if canola is not accessing the urea and ammonium, you can kind of tweak that by going earlier and hopefully getting it converted over to nitrate by the time it needs it. So it, whether it's a timing or a form of N, but I don't know. you didn't know. change the timing this year, you kept them the same? We kept the I... timing the same, yes. And, I, and I'm going to resubmit an application for funding to kind of answer that question because it, it totally surprised us. And, and even the differences between canola and wheat, what we saw in the fertigation, surprised us. We thought, if anything, canola was more flexible than the wheat, but it was almost looking like it was less flexible. Anyways, thanks for your time, and I'll, we'll try to see those plots when we can actually see the effects of the growth regulator and hopefully see some good disease pressure. <coughs> <clears throat> in our in our fusarium component. Well, join me in thanking Dune. I just have one little statement before we we end today. The Canadian Canola Growers Association of Canada, along with some grain commissions, is actually filing uh, a bit of a lawsuit against CN and CP regarding the grain lack of grain <clears throat> movements until March of this year. They've come back to the, the growers looking for actual farmers who have experienced that lack of grain movement and either suffered because they weren't able to pay their bills to get the cash flow and such. So if any of you guys, farmers in particular, felt like there was an issue in moving grain this last year and wouldn't mind letting their name stand, 
uh, within this this complaint that's being put forward. I'd ask that you come and, and talk to me, and I'll put you in touch with uh, with Rick White. He's the CEO of the Canadian Canola Growers Association of Canada. So it's kind of been a big issue this last year, and I, and uh, I think they're trying to put some efforts towards making sure that that uh, that type of situation doesn't necessarily happen again in the future. So. With that, I'd like to thank uh, all of the speakers today, Dune, Shama, and Daryl, and thank you guys as well. You're welcome to stick around, ask questions, look around. I think there's quite a bit of uh, donuts and coffee left, so uh, have a little visit.